Hi, everybody. My name's Gary Ryan, and I'm the director and CEO of the Virginia Museum of Contemporary Art, and I am thrilled to welcome you to tonight's program. I'm not going to say much other than a big thanks to the women who um, helped pull tonight together. First and foremost among them is Allison Byrne, who is our director of exhibitions and education. Um, and she will be doing most of the talking and introducing of the other two women, Melissa Messina and Dorothy Moss, who um, Melissa has um, been our partner in bringing forward the Myelin work. And Dorothy has been a wonderful partner because there is going to be another exhibition opening up in the um, end of September affiliated with the Smithsonian, the National Portrait Gallery, that goes through Maya Lin's um, bi biography and kind of tells the story of Maya Lin. So we couldn't be um, happier to kind of be in this passing off the baton in um, a couple of different ways um, to Dorothy. So without much further ado, I just wanted to say welcome and thank you so much for coming out tonight. And thank you, Mary Washington, for your alumni event here. It's wonderful to have you here. And Allison, do you want to join me up here? All right, thank you. Thanks, Gary. Good evening, everyone. So I'm Alison Byrne. I'm the Deputy Director for Exhibitions and Education here at Virginia MoCA, and I'm thrilled to have you all here tonight. Before we get started, I'd like to remind everyone to please silence your cell phones. We are uh, recording this talk. Um, I also wanted to let you know that the galleries are open until 8 p.m. tonight, so if you'd like to go in and see Maya Lynn, A Study of Water afterwards, we would encourage you to do so. I want to take a moment to thank all of our supporters of the exhibition. Special thanks to presenting sponsor, Dominion Energy, with additional support from the City of Virginia Beach, the Batten Foundation, Sintera Healthcare, Mackenzie Construction Corporation, the Brock Foundation, Suzanne and Vince Mastraco, Arlene Cohen and family, Susan and Andy Cohen, Andrew and Barbara Fine, Susan and Craig Gruby, Steve Lawson and Vivian Montano, Meredith and Brother Rudder, Shavrick and Partners, the Van Dievender Family Foundation in memory of Anne Van Dievender, Linda H. Kaufman, Allison Whitmore, the Runnymig Corporation, Betty Darden, Tom and Allison Johnson, the Esther and Alan Fleeter Foundation, Virginia Commission for the Arts, Arts Alliance, the City of Portsmouth, WPL Landscape Architecture, Green Sward and Hercules Fence with free admission made possible by the Good Foundation. We have some amazing supporters. Thank you all and thank you to all of our members who are here tonight. A very, very, very special thank you to Maya Lynn and her studio director, James Ewart, who were incredible to work with, as well as Casey Carter and Liza Petard from the What Is Missing Foundation and Alexander Brown from Pace Gallery. Now, I have the privilege of introducing our two special guests. I could pretty much spend the entirety of the program speaking about these amazing women and their accomplishments. They are brilliant, but I will share just a few highlights so we can get them up here on stage. Melissa Messina, our guest curator for the exhibition, has been an absolute joy to collaborate with over the past couple of years to bring this exhibition to life. Melissa is a nationally recognized arts professional who's developed thought-provoking exhibitions, dynamic site-responsive projects, and engaging educational projects programming, both independently and in organizations. For 20 years, her work with national, regional, and international artists has been presented in the US and abroad. She's lectured extensively, published widely, and her research has been funded by Creative Time and the Andy Warhol Foundation, as well as by fellowships at Emory University's Stuart A. Rose Library in Atlanta, Georgia, and the Crystal Bridges Museum of American Art in Bentonville, Arkansas. Melissa, thank you for being here. Dorothy Moss is curator of painting and sculpture at the Smithsonian Institution's National Portrait Gallery. Her recent projects include the exhibition and book Hung Lu, Portraits of Promised Lands, and the Obama Portraits. In 2015, Moss initiated Identify, the National Portrait Gallery's first performance art series, an ongoing program featuring commissioned performances by internationally recognized artists. Her upcoming exhibitions include One Life, Maya Lin, opening on September 30th, I think we should plan a road trip, and Kinship, opening in October of this year. So please join me in welcoming Melissa and Dorothy to the stage. Hello. Good evening, everyone. <laughs> I think you can do better than that. Hello. All right. 
what a thrill to be here. I just I want to thank everyone here in Virginia Beach for welcoming me. It's my first time in Virginia Beach, so I'm absolutely delighted um, and so happy to be here with you, Melissa. Likewise, likewise. And we um, really kind of conceived of this exhibition in learning about yours and thinking how different it was from the approach that we took to presenting Maya's work. So I think this will be a really fun conversation. I'd love to learn more about your show. And yes, let's plan a field trip for sure um, to talk a little bit about how your exhibition came about, what its scope is, and, and maybe we can talk about this a little bit and what, what we've each learned um, from working with Maya and her incredible studio. Yes, I mean, congratulations, Gary, and your team, and to Melissa for this beautiful installation. It is stunning um, and really captures Maya Lynn's beautiful poetic approach to art making and her commitment to the environment. And I love the regional focus. I love what your educators are doing um, and congratulations to Truly for such a dynamic program. I want to bring my colleagues at the Smithsonian to look at what's happening here and think about what we can do in our spaces. Um, our exhibition is very different because it is part of our One Life visual biography series and we have had um, a number of, of these exhibitions that focus on the biography of a person who has been influential. Recent One Life exhibitions include Will Rogers, um, Sylvia Plath, uh, an, an upcoming one is on Frederick Douglass, and uh, Dolores Huerta was the first time that we looked at an individual who was living. And, their contributions. This is the first time that we have focused a One Life exhibition on an Asian American subject. And we are very proud to be working with Maya Lin. And it, to be honest, took me a little while to convince her um, to agree to let us do this because she is, as you might know, and if you heard her speak here, she's very self-effacing. She's a very private person. And she does not want to be in the limelight. She was thrust into the limelight when she was a young woman um, having just graduated from Yale University when the Vietnam Veterans Memorial was unveiled. And since then, for the past 40 years, she has created magnificent work, but she has always tried to put herself in the background. And so one way that I convinced her that we needed to do this at the Smithsonian was to inspire young people to tell her story as a story of resilience, of strength, and of determination. And when she heard that, she did say, yes, there have been a lot of middle school books published about me. And so I do think young people will be interested. And she agreed. So that really melted my heart. And um, she's been very generous in opening up her studio and her archive and allowing us at the National Portrait Gallery to select artwork for the exhibition and photographs and sketchbooks and objects that she made as a young child um, to show how her early life, her early influences, and her family life shaped her vision. And I think you see that vision in full force here. Um, and I, before we get into the National Portrait Gallery's exhibition in more detail, I'm curious about how this exhibition came to be. Yeah. Um, Really, um, in a very serendipitous and collaborative way, um, the relationship between Maya and her family existed with a board member at the museum. And I understand there had been um, some persuasive conversations going on for a while as well. Um, simultaneously, Allison and I um, met through a mutual friend, and we'd been talking about collaborating on a project. Um, a lot of my curatorial background has been working with um, female artists, predominantly female sculptors. So it really was kind of of this beautiful moment where they said, hey, we have this opportunity and we've been talking to you. Maybe this is the, the right moment to work together. Um, and so really it was sort of my job as a guest curator to think about how we would present Maya Lin here. You know, what would be interesting to this audience? What would make it a unique exhibition for the um, Virginia Mocha audience um, for this moment in time? Because of course, as we will talk about her, she is so prolific and her work is so so multifaceted, um, but it really occurred to me that 
probably a lot of people in this region as being close to DC might really know her as the maker of the Vietnam Veterans Memorial, right? And she is so much more than that and has done so much since then. So it was really an opportunity to say, okay, how does a contemporary art museum in this particular part of the world educate about Maya's artistic practice, her fine art practice. And so water seemed like the obvious choice, um, certainly because of the location here, her 30 year commitment to it as a theme throughout her work. And then of course the way it connects to her broader environmental concerns as a visual artist and as an architect and um, you know, sort of um, activist in that way, so. And it's, it's fascinating. Melissa and I have been talking about the process of putting together an exhibition with a living artist who is such an iconic figure. Um, and I was curious to know more about her involvement in the installation, in the selection of objects. Um, in the case of the portrait gallery, it's, it's very different because we're showing some of her private photographs and her personal objects and sketchbooks. And so she's been very involved in the selection, but not in a way that has been overpowering. We've had a dialogue and a back and forth to figure out what will work best for our audiences and our spaces. But I'm curious to know with these large scale installations that you're showing, how you worked with her yeah. and her studio. I'm curious to know more about that because that yeah. sounds fascinating. <laughs> our process, um, was a little more hands-off. These are all works that have pre been presented before with the exception of the installation that she made specifically for the show. So I think, you know, it doesn't have that same intimacy where you're telling the narrative of her of her life. So certainly, um, yeah, I know I would want to really be involved in that conversation if it were me, right? Um, so we had the opportunity you know, it's fascinating when you hear Maya Lin speak and the first thing she says is, half of my time I'm an architect and half of my time I'm making fine art. And when you look at the outpouring of prolific nature of her work, you think, how did, does she ever sleep? You know, I mean, that's two more than full-time jobs, right? Um, so it, her studio is really divided accordingly. She has a staff that handles her architectural projects and she has a staff that handles her um, fine art and sort of the, the curatorial presentation of the work. So as Allison alluded to, she has a great team. Um, James is her, is her gallery, um, I mean, is her studio director. And so when we developed the kind of theme and overarching arc for the show, I kind of created a wish list. You know, I sort of looked at, um, I wanted to show as much work as possible over the course of her career, that it wasn't just brand new work, that you all would be able to see work that she made 30 years ago and see how some of those themes move through into work that was made, again, specifically for the show. And so um, I kind of developed a wish list and thought, okay, these are kind of some really you know, key pieces to what we're trying to say with the show. And then of course, as a curator, you're sort of subject to what's available, you know. Um, there was a piece that was broken. There was a piece that was sold. Um, and so we really kind of worked with her studio to think about um, of what was available from that list, what made the most sense, what would tell the story um, that we were trying to, to tell in this space. So we can talk a little bit more about that. But it was, it was a collaborative process, um, but definitely um, led by sort of a curatorial um, thematic vision for the exhibition, which of course is less personal than, than looking through baby pictures, right? <laughs> right, or, or as you see on the screen, her Halston hat that she wore and is, became known for during the Vietnam Memorial unveiling period. She wore that hat to cover her eyes to hide herself from the press. She was so young and so vulnerable and so small physically. And uh, both the veterans and the supporters um, um, from the architectural community and the design community and the critics were constantly surrounding her. Uh, so objects like that I thought were important to pull into my exhibition to speak to her lived experience um, as an architect and as someone who came into the public eye as a young person. I'd love to back up just a little bit. To, I know you spoke about um, you know, why you selected her but 
given the square footage, given the parameters of what you're dealing with, how, how what is the sort of arc of the show? And what were you, did you have sort of um, preconceived, did you know you wanted to include that hat? Or was it more of kind of conversations with her and looking through materials that helped you make your selections? It, it was a combination. I have a one space to work with. It's one room. And we are the third oldest building in Washington. Um, the building was built in the, it started uh, in the 1830s and continued to be built through the late 19th century. Uh, we have vaulted ceilings and marble floors, um, and it can be tricky to show large scale uh, contemporary works of art. And this uh, exhibition series is designed to be more intimate anyway, so I really wanted to bring in smaller objects like sketchbooks and drawings and family photographs and objects that she owned like the hat that spoke to her experience, as well as her Yale yearbook, which is fascinating to me because her uh, photograph in the Yale yearbook is a self-portrait through a mirror. And she has very long hair, but she's done this very unconventional yearbook photograph of herself. And then the writing next to it, which is a, a long paragraph, um, all in lowercase with hardly any periods, any punctuation, just it's sort of a stream of consciousness about her memories of being an undergraduate. That to me says so much about her personality and who she is. Uh, so I was looking for things like that, that really spoke to her as um, an individual. And, and then I loved hearing from her about her family experience growing up in rural Ohio. Both of her parents were professors. Her father was a ceramicist. Her mother was a poet and later a professor of English literature. Um, her mother came to the United States from communist China in the 1940s to attend Smith College. And she came with $20 sewn into her clothing and her acceptance letter to Smith. Um, and Maya Lin talked about what a strong influence her mother was on her throughout her life, that her mother expected the same things of her as she did of her older brother, Tom. And I and her mother and father were very much interested in her intellect and, and um, celebrating her curiosity and leaving her to play outside in the hills around their home and in the woods around their home. And she talks about talking with the chipmunks and following the deer and sitting alone and creating these worlds for herself and her brother in nature. And that's where she said she really became committed to the environment in those early years as a child, nurtured by her parents and, um, and encouraged to play outdoors. And she often talks about the way she works as play. And she was criticized for that in the press as a young person when she made that comment uh, to a Washington Post critic. But she said she'll never, ever uh, not think of the way she works as play, which I love. So I wanted to bring out her childhood in this exhibition to really emphasize that, early, that the importance of those early years growing up in rural Ohio, in the hills and with the trees and surrounded by animals um, and, and having all that freedom. And she talks about um, having started college as a biology major. And I find that really fascinating because you see, of course, her interest in nature, in the environment, in biology, and in, in all of her work. And I love that you reiterated that, that notion of play because I think in her fine art practice and what we really wanted to get across in the show too is it's, it is this sort of beautiful alchemy between something that is um, intuitive and, and poetic, and yet it's based on data. It's based on, you know, she's looking at maps. She's, you know, looking at, na you know, images of, of the planet that are from NASA. You know, she's, she's taking data, at this, you know, sort of dry, raw information that's factual, but, but, but through play, right, through that kind of intuitive artistic process, you're getting so much more than just the information at hand. You're sort of being being moved. But I, I did find it fascinating that she started 
school as a biology major, and by the time she graduated college, she had already made one of the most important <laughs> monuments um, in the world you know, at 21. So right. can you talk a little bit about some of the materials related to the memorial? Because I'm, I'm sure that's what a lot of people in DC are, are going to, yes. to expect to see as well. well. And this November is the 40th anniversary of the <laughs> unveiling of the Vietnam Veterans Memorial, which factored into the timing of this exhibition. But she also made it very clear that she wants that part of her career to be part of the whole, mm -hmm. not for this exhibition to solely focus on the Vietnam Veterans Memorial. Uh, but there will be one wall dedicated to the memorial and will include sketches that we are borrowing from Yale University, um, beautiful pastels, which you've seen scrolling through, um, that are very simple, very modernist in um, in their look, and those were her early sketches when she was first envisioning what the memorial would look like. Um, and so there will be some sort of preparatory sketches for the memorial. The Library of Congress owns the competition boards that uh, were her entry into the competition, and those will be on view at the Library of Congress. And then across the street from the National Portrait Gallery is the Martin Luther King Library, which is a Mies van der Rohe building. It's part of the DC Public Library system, and that's where what is missing will be shown. So we have sort of a canvassing of Maya Lin across DC with the National Portrait Gallery's show being sort of a nucleus where it's uh, getting um, a look at, at her biography and an insider view of her life, but then these other destinations to learn more. Um, and part of the reason for, and I want to ask you about this, Melissa, showing what is missing across the street is that it is a project that is ongoing. It involves multiple components. It's multimedia. And it's a challenge for some exhibitions to host because if you really want to host the um, complete what is missing, it, the infrastructure needs to be there. But Mylan, I love, is very flexible in how this work can be shown. And she works with each institution um, to make it work. And when I realized that we didn't have the infrastructure to show the interactive multimedia, you know, the um, LED screens that she wanted to include, that the library across the street could do it. And that would actually expand the audience and help us create more educational programming around it and um, activate our relationship with the library. So that's how we're Perfect working timing. with the that. Yeah. <laughs> so I would love to know more about how you thought through showing what is missing and how you problem solved um, the technical aspects. Sure, sure. And, and um, for those of you who maybe aren't as familiar, what is missing um, Maya really thinks of as her final memorial. It's her global memorial to the planet. Um, and it has been ongoing since 2005, um, really exhibited, um, I think, around 2009. So she, it took a few years to really conceive of. And I think she's still conceiving of it. I mean, it, it's a, it's, she describes it as a guerrilla art project. Um, it's been developing over time online, in real time, you know, sort of warts and all, um, as technology has developed. Um, but what she is trying to do with this project is it feels sort of three-pronged, I guess would, might be the best way to describe it, in, in that it's a repository for scientific information. She takes um, statistics about climate change and environmental issues from leading scientific institutions around the globe, and so it is a place to get information. And she sort of couples it with um, climate-based solutions, nature-based climate solutions. And so you're, not, you know, you sort of go on and you're reading um, about the doom and gloom that is sort of the reality of the state of our planet. But then at the same time, you're also seeing intervention. You're seeing innovation. You're seeing sort of um, ideas for a more hopeful future that there are there are solutions to solve the problem. And then thirdly, there is a place to leave a memory, leave an experience. She really wants it to be something participatory. And so again, this sort of lives online, but where is the information generated from? And primarily, it's coming from exhibitions. And so the challenge for the curators working in their spaces, and again, the challenges of those spaces is how do you present this? And how do you make it um, relevant? How do you get people excited about 
the information that's there and hopefully kind of spark a call to action and, and some, 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 maybe some personal reflection on how we each can contribute to these solutions. Um, and so what we chose to do here was try to present it kind of in two ways. Um, one, I, we, we've been kind of teasingly say is the analog version, and then we have the digital version. And I think it actually works really beautifully in the show in that you're walking into, um, and we can talk about the layout of the overall exhibition, which is an expansive gallery, which is kind of an unusual way to present her work, and we can chat about that too. But you, you know, sort of walk into an alcove, and it's a very small, intimate space, and you're given information, um, but you're also asked to leave a memory. And so I think it's a beautiful way to sort of get a, get. I sort of looked at the wall and said, this is a constellation of the community, right? This is the energy of everybody who's come through this space. And they've left a note, they've left their mark, they've left a question or a memory or an experience of something that um, speaks to them about nature. And Maya will look through all of those. They return to her studio when the, when the show is over. And many of them get added to the repository, to the What is Missing project. So we're all creating the memorial together. Right, and that's really the ethos of, of, of the show. And so coupled with that is a more black box space where you sit in a dark room and it really is meant to evoke loss. It is, a, is meant to evoke absence. And her team created over 100 sort of narratives, entries, um, what she calls the Chesapeake Bay timeline. And so you're looking at um, other people's memories and other people's documentation of this region, both from prehistory to the colonial times to the industrial era to, to, to legislation that's, that's happening today to try to correct some of those wrongs. And so there's, again, that kind of participatory aspect to it, but there's also the, you know, let me kind of sit here and reflect and take in this information. And so I think the two are intended to really hopefully evoke and inspire a call to action. I love that. It, it's um, interesting in the context of Washington to show that project because obviously the policymakers are there and mm -hmm. um, there's so much happening right now in terms of climate change and policy making, but there's also this idea that this is her final memorial. And it's a book. She says it's never going to be. She's like, I will work on this till the it, day I it die. Will, it will continue um, for her through her life. And it's a she sees it in Washington as a bookend to the Vietnam Memorial, which for me makes the Vietnam Memorial turn into a screen. You know, it's like we we thought about and talked about showing um, one wall with the Vietnam Memorial blown up and then across on the other wall a, a screen. And, um, and when we realized we couldn't actually do that successfully and because of security issues, we couldn't connect with the internet in the gallery and have the visitors have the interactive part be internet-based, um, we started thinking through, well, what can we do to bring this outside the museum, outside the walls of the museum, so that the Vietnam Memorial kind of becomes part of the exhibition, and then the um, what's missing is another part of the exhibition outside the walls and speaks to this idea of memorials and what they can be. I mean, Maya Lin broke all boundaries. Um, all notions of what a memorial is with the Vietnam Memorial in many ways. And, and this project does the same. And memorials are such a topic of discussion right now. Necessary, so I'm sure. hoping that in the context of Washington, we can also have some programming around what a memorial is um, and the contributions that Maya Lin has made in that regard. It's so special. One thing that happened, with, just as an aside, with what is missing that we didn't quite expect is in the black box space, as the timeline narratives are going by, there's also a sound component. And they were um, collected uh, through Audubon societies. And, and so you're not only, you know, sort of taking in the information, but you're surrounded by nature sounds. And I think, you know, anybody who's been in Virginia Beach for five minutes, here's the planes going by, yeah. right? So you walk into the gallery and you're in this very pristine, this beautiful and austere gallery, and all of a sudden nature sounds overtake you. And we sort of didn't quite anticipate the effect that was going to have on the reading of the show and as you're moving through the space. So that was just kind of a fun um, addition to how what is missing, you know, really influenced the, the entirety of the exhibition. 
I'm curious, did, is, uh, did Myelin study the sounds of this region? Did, is that part of? Yes, okay. the, so the sounds are collected from, from different libraries that, are, that have regionally done the collecting that she didn't, per, her team didn't personally do the collecting, um, but, but found the sources and was able Amazing. to compile them for the timeline, yeah. That's great, and she has such a personal approach yes. um, while her work is so modernist and it can be so simple at first glance. Uh, you Once you know her, and I'm hoping the exhibition at the Portrait Gallery will bring this out, you see how her um, approach to life, which is very poetic, and I think that comes from her mother and her, her father, the ceramicist, um, her approach to life is really, um, and she talks about growing up in a house that was beautiful but simple and streamlined. Um, her father's aesthetic was very modernist, and some of his pottery will be in the exhibition so oh, that you can exciting. see the way his eye influenced her eye. Um, and she said, she, as he was dying, she saw her hands and his hands. Um, she was very much aesthetically influenced by his vision. Um, but her mother, who um, approached life through poetry, also created a daughter who became a poet visually. I love how she, we talked about this earlier, describes a river as a drawing in the landscape. Um, the way she speaks about uh, the landscape is, is poetic and really from a writer's perspective. And the sketchbooks that we're showing um, reveal that the beginning of her process always starts with words. She will write words on a page, and then the words become drawings. And then she will sketch around the words and drawings until she comes to this concept that then she starts to implement on a different scale with three-dimensional drawings. And we have some of those three-dimensional drawings in the exhibition. And then she goes out to the landscape and starts studying the land and how this uh, very early concept that started in language uh, can be made into a monumental, oftentimes, work of art. So, you know, I'm, I'm hoping through a very carefully selected grouping of objects that she has, you know, been part of the selection and very much uh, thinking through how to streamline telling the story um, will, will come out and, and that you will see the multi-step process of her art making. And I was really fascinated and, and really wanted to convey through the exhibition her ingenious use of materials, just yeah. very common materials. And so even the land works that she made, which you, you touched on a little bit, um, you know, she's, she's really thinking about the physics of that material, the metaphysics of that material, the symbolism of that material. I mean, looking at something like Flow, which is this large piece behind me, I mean, she is looking at scientific data of wave patterns and tidal waves and reproducing it through recycled two by fours, you know, and, and, and turning the recycled two by fours into something much larger than the sum of its parts, right? I mean, when you walk around that piece, you really do have sort of an embodied reaction to it. I don't, when I walk by it, I sort of feel the wave, right? You sort of walking around it and imagining yourself kind of riding that wave or on a boat or um, I was thinking about the way the sort of um, rings in the wood look like our, our fingerprints mm. or you might think about deforestation or you might think about how your home withstood the last storm, right? That she's translating all of the properties of wood and yet somehow conveying these broader notions of water, right? That she kind of can transform a material beyond just its its common use. And at the same time, I think there's something really, um, uh, you know, sometimes contemporary art can, can be intimidating. And so by using something like a steel pin that we all understand, everyone has steel pin, you know, little teeny pin somewhere in their house or little glass marbles, you know, there's something about that materiality that feels familiar and feels approachable and you can kind of go to these pieces which are very deeply conceptual and very deeply, you know, specifically modern. And yet there's not, a, I, I don't find the intimidation factor, you know? I'm wondering if yeah, you no, I, saw I, that in, in your work. You I know? think um, her 
personalization of everything and making us feel connected to the natural world in a way that is how we, you know, experience the natural world individually, uh, including her project, the Memory Project, where she asked uh, young people to sit with someone from an older generation, a family member or a, a friend, and talk about the way the climate or the landscape has changed in a place that is special to them. And I had this experience just recently taking my daughter to camp in the mountains of Western North Carolina with my mother who had, who had gone to the same camp. And my daughter got out at her cabin and said, oh, this, there's such a beautiful tree in front of the cabin. And my mother said, I was in that cabin and that was a twig <laughs> when I was here. You know, and just having this experience of having a dialogue about a place and then to think about what has changed here? Why has it changed? For the good or for the worse and why? Um, and so she's asking museum visitors to do this with her projects. And I think that that's a way into some of her very conceptual work and her grand thinking and her activism um, from the direct ex lived experience of each person who encounters the work. Yeah, she talks a lot about how, you know, particularly with water, the conversations we were having is that we sort of understand, understand water by where our feet are at the shore, right? What we've experienced, our lake or our private waterfall or our, um, you know, beach that we go to every year, right? So sometimes these um, broader issues around water can feel... Um, all encompassing and that maybe we can't do anything about it or it's much bigger than us or what what do, what what does an iceberg or the 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 Laurentide ice shelf have to do with me and yet we're hoping through this exhibition that you're looking at the global uh, presentations of water you're looking at all of a, a map um, of all of the, the the rivers that flow to the North Pole, but then you're also standing right at the foot of the Chesapeake, right? Mm -hmm. So she's helping us understand that what goes on up, we all live downstream, right? Mm -hmm. What goes on upstream affects us downstream. And I do, I think that personal co co connection, excuse me, is, is what she's aiming for um, in, in all of the iterations of her work. Yeah, and it really does position us in relationship to the world and our own environments in new ways. And I remember when I first met her, it was through the National Portrait Gallery's program of commissioning new artworks, um, new portraits of an influential person. And our board had asked us to commission a new portrait of Maya Lin. And I went to her studio to meet with her, and I proposed an artist who works in very large scale, um, and this would be a time-based media work. And she said, no, <laughs> I will not um, be videoed on large scale. That's not who I am. And I said, well, that's fine. Let's talk about who we might consider. And she said, well, the Armory Art Fair is on right now. Let's get in a taxi. So we did. And we went to see a Berlin-based artist named Karen Sonder, who was making 3D um, printed figures of visitors to the art fair. And Maya's brother, Tom, knew Karen. And uh, so they already had a connection. And Maya posed in her jeans and a sweater, what she was wearing that day to work in a very casual pose. And Karen ended up printing this small sculpture in, um, in Europe. And I love the fact that Maya Lynn wanted to be seen as small. It's printed about that big. And in the end, it was because she sees herself as tiny in relation to the natural world. And her activist work is one way of um, making us all see that we all play a part, um, but that we're, we're not, you know, we, we need to step back and see ourselves as part of the whole. And I thought that was revelatory, actually, to get that um, early insight into who she was and, and to be able to present her idea of herself, um, you know, in this tiny sculpture as, as she says, an action figure, but one who is, uh, you know, someone who's very aware that um, 
she's part of a bigger picture. She does deserve her own action figure. She does. I, 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 I like that. I like that. <laughs> um, having just been on Time's 100 Most Influential People yes. this year. <laughs> right. So that was really exciting um, for her and, and for us getting to, to work with her and bring her work to broader audiences. Was there anything, you know, we learned so much about the artists or their work as, as we're developing projects as curators. Was there anything that, that really surprised you? Was there something you thought you knew about her, but through the process maybe shifted your, your thought or a surprising object that you gravitated toward? I, I really think learning more about her childhood as a childhood that was in nature um, without a lot of interference from adults, her, her parents believed in her and supported her, but they let her be free in nature. And she enjoyed that. She talked about, as a child, not wanting a lot of friends around her, but having an inner life. And I, I found that interesting because I do think that you see that in her work. Um, and it's quiet nature and and her attention to detail um, and and the poetry of it and I also found it interesting that she always felt that she could do more I mean as a young person she was always very driven and no one was putting pressure on her she just loved to learn she had a fierce curiosity a fierce intellect um, she loved to make things and to watch her father in his studio and, um, and she wanted to push herself. And then when I asked her about how do you take on different projects from a civil rights memorial to the women's table at Yale to some of the large scale land earthworks, um, you know, where are you at the beginning of these processes or do you feel like you need to know a lot before engaging in something that addresses civil rights, for example, and she said she loves to learn, she's always loved to learn, and she's curious. And so she'll learn as much as she can in the preparation, um, and she never needs to be an expert at the end. And I thought that was interesting too. She, The process of making is the process of learning, and the end goal is not to be the expert or to have the final word, but to open others' minds and to create a situation where there can be dialogue around a topic. Um, and then that's how she opens up history, too. And I love the idea that her engagement with the land uh, and with human rights and women's rights is um, an engagement with history, ultimately. It's interesting to hear her, and again, in that very self-effacing way, she says, well, I just present facts. Yeah. But, it's, but when you do, I mean, really, the root of, of every piece, you go, oh, really, she is. I mean, even with the, the, the Vietnam Memorial, she, she looked at the facts, and she wanted to lay them out in, in, a, in a factual way. And she said, if people are presented with the facts, I mean, even thinking about the What is Missing project, she says, well, what, we can't save, if, save things that we don't know are disappearing. And so I think she really does want to sort of arm us with information, but she does it in such a disarming way that it allows us in and gives us room. And as you said, she doesn't position herself any higher than us. That it, it, The personal stories, your personal experience with the work is just as important and that we, you know, are all equal in trying to, you know, solve these very big problems. But it, it does come from 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 the facts at, from the ground level, right? From the facts and from empathy, a place of empathy. She does use that word. And um, she sees her approach to the landscape um, and to the stories of lives who are lost um, as a story that is coming from a place of empathy in her creative self. And so I also see that in what might look at first to be austere works, um, the closer you look, the more you see her hand and her soul and her um, very gentle way of of making work that is inviting and thought provoking and can change your perspective. You know, and sometimes even the absence of her hand does that as well. I think one of my favorite pieces in the show is a series of prints called White Fracture. They're very simple. They're white on white. Um, yeah, you really have to kind of spend some time with them. Um, but th it's a series of five, and in each image, it almost looks like these sort of floating land masses are disappearing. And 
she made them through a really um, kind of an experimental printmaking process where she was using a glass plate um, and fed it through the printing press but put more pressure and so it would crack the glass. And so what you're seeing as the landmass in these prints is the embossment of the pressure of the cracked glass. Mm -hmm. And it's such an interesting, her hand, you know, it, it's certainly her hand involved in creating that um, additional pressure to, to crack the glass, but there's a sort of a level of controlled removal there too. And when I sit in front of those works and I think, wow, there really is an austerity to them and yet they're so emotional, you know, there's really something magical in her work that brings those those that kind of polar, you know, that that hand, but the but the distance to, together in in some sort of ethereal way. Absolutely, yeah. yeah. And I think you'll see in some of the images of her working mm -hmm. in the landscape where she's standing on ladders and climbing up hills and and or making um, work with steel in a foundry. She's physically engaged, um, her body is in it. And I also find that really interesting too, because while the outcome can feel removed, um, you see the process and it, it, it's very personal, it's very physical, and, and she's deeply engaged. Um, and she's overseeing everything. Absolutely. She doesn't necessarily send her studio out to to look at the land, to work. She's out there from ground zero, you know, working hard to envision it. And then she's overseeing every aspect. So um, And making changes on the ground. With some of the, the groundwork, she talked about how, um, you know, the, the computer patterns that were generated for these land formations, once she got on site, it, it wasn't doing what she wanted it to do. So how do you, you know, the, you're not dealing with a pencil and a piece of paper, you're dealing with a bulldozer and a crew, right? So mm -hmm. how do you um, sort of orchestrate that to get it right? And, it, and she moved beyond just, this is what I thought was going to work, to, okay, now that we're here on site, how do, how do we really make this function as an, you know, as an experience. Right. And I found that so fascinating. <laughs> yes. Well, and one thing I'm curious about, Melissa, is I mean, Maya Lynn has said herself that she loves iterations. She loves to have projects that evolve. And so I'm wondering with this brilliant exhibition here, what is the next iteration of it? I think her exhibitions never really end. Um, another thing that's wonderful about working with her, because you're never quite sure what the next chapter will be, yeah. but um, is there a plan for this show? We're talking about that. It's a, a really great question because I think, you know, we were so steeped in making sure that this show was really unique to this museum. And showing her dedication as a very, you know, busy artist and architect, she was... Um, as inspired as we were from the beginning to make sure that there was at least one work that was site responsive. So in the gallery, you see the uh, Marble and Del uh, Marble Chesapeake and Delaware Bay, um, which was made specifically for this exhibition, um, modified, you know, for the space built on site um, by staff and volunteers and members and Maya's crew and um, gluing marbles for hours. <laughs> um, so, you know, that was really our goal for the show is let's, let's really make it specific to here, make sure that there's a very global and local conversation going on. And when Maya came, um, speaking to the physicality too, the first thing she did was took her shoes off and walked over flow and we all went, <laughs> You know, I mean, no one's allowed to touch that, but of course Maya can walk across it. <laughs> but it, that was, that was a, we all sort of held our breath and watched her walk across it. Um, but she was really, this was the first time that her representations of water over the course of 30 years were shown together in one room. And I think she was really moved by that. And again, because what is missing is such a repository for information and her team gathered so much information, so much data was gathered for what is missing that is specific to this region. And But again, has that ripple effect being tied to, to global issues. Um, we are in conversations about traveling the show um, so that again, other institutions can do what we did here, which was educate about a 30-year, very prolific, you know, practice, but also in 
have it engage in a very specific dialogue that relates to an audience. And hopefully, as the show will travel and all of that information is gathered in each exhibition, it's adding to what is missing as a memorial. So the exhibition is sort of feeding the, the memorial. Um, so we're hoping that it will travel. We're, to, you know, more, more to come on that. That's wonderful. I, I think it's really exciting when an exhibition inspires um, a series of exhibitions, which it sounds like this could do. And I think it's important to recognize how wonderful it is that Maya is open to um, rethinking, reimagining. Um, she's um, such a high profile figure and has so many projects happening at one time. Uh, but when she's focused on the work and working with the curators and the institution, it's really magical. Um, and what a gift to have been able to, um, for both of us, to have had this encounter with her and to share her vision. Yeah. It's the best part of curating. I think. It really, really is. And I think a gift is really the, the right word. She has a gift, as you said, as this incredible intellect and has this incredible artistic vision as a as a activist for, for the planet. Um, and it really is a gift. And I think that, I think she sees it that way too, in the way that when you give someone a gift, there's a reciprocity there, right? Mm -hmm. And so there's an exchange. And I think she feels that. And I hope when you walk through the gallery, which stays open till eight, I understand we have about 45 more minutes for you to come and see the show. So we'll, we'll wrap up. Um, but I do think that with that gift, um, you know, comes a responsibility on, on our part as well. So I hope that you are all moved by the exhibition, that you will participate in the What is Missing project um, and come back and see the show again and again. It, open, it closes, um, sorry, Labor Day weekend? Labor Day weekend. And then your show opens when? Tell September us when we can see your show. September 30th um, through April. So please come to Washington and let me know if you do. <laughs> Thank you all again Thank for you. being here.